That's a good song. Amen. Amen. We're going to be in two places today as the kiddos go to Children's Church. We'll be Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41, and hold your place there. We're going to be in Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Isaiah 41, we're going to pick it up in verse 10, and he says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, I will uphold thee in the right hand of my righteousness. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee, <coughs> against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they that strive shall, uh, with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them and shalt not find them. Even, even them that contend with thee, they that war against thee shall be as nothing, and as, in, as a nothing, <clears throat> and as a thing of naught, for I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Fear not, thou, thou worm, Jacob, and ye men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord, and, the, <clears throat> and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Turn to, hold your place there, because we're going to come back. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10 for me real quick. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. For he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this blessed book. Uh, thank you for it. I pray that you help us to see this text here, and, and uh, Lord, take me out of the message and uh, make it so that they know when they have a time to fear that they fear not, and that when, when, that when a time comes that you've got them taken care of. Help us to see that. Help us to encourage others in that, and I pray that you be um, honored and glorified in this message today so that 
uh, you, um, all the glory and praise goes to you and not to this church, not to, not to, certainly not to me. And, and I pray that you're in it and that it is your words. Lord, I pray that it finds soft hearts to fall upon and that these words are an encouragement to those in times of trouble. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, last week, last week I was kind of hard on y'all. And, uh, and that's okay. It's needed. I understand that. But last week I was kind of hard on you. Uh, and the last week, the message last week was on a lack of spiritual growth in the church, and that's a tough one. That's a tough message. And if there's one thing that I know about us Bible believers is we like to preach hard. We like hard preaching. I know I like sitting in a place and, and, and getting that hard preaching. I, I need that from time to time. That's why I go to the Jubilee. Last year, I got beat up and beat up and beat up the entire th five days of the Lord just beating on me. And believe it or not, I enjoyed that. It was tough. It was hard. Don't get me wrong, but I enjoyed it. We need that hard preaching because it's easy for a preacher to be so negative. It's easy. It's all around us everywhere we go. Because that's our default setting with people also. We don't, when, when, someone, when someone walks into, into a room, we don't say, oh, I love this about you or that or that. What do we instantly say? Oh, I know what they did. Or I can't believe they did this to me that one time. That's our default setting. We can't get out of that sometimes. As we see the negatives. And when we look at the scripture, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, it tells us to preach the word. And this is talking specifically to me. Preach the word. Be instant. It doesn't say be instant, comma, in season. It says be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Now, us Baptists likes the reprove and rebuke, but we don't often do the exhortation. See, the first two are negative, and the third one is a positive. So reprove means to blame, to place blame. Rebuke means to chasten or chide, and exhort means to encourage. We love to do that chastening or chiding as a preacher because it's easy. What's hard to do is the third part. See, people love to reprove and they love to rebuke, <clears throat> um, and where they lack is exhortation. And that's not for lack of example. All through the scripture, we see how the Lord exhorted people. We read in our text in Isaiah chapter 41, he tells us three times, Fear thou not, verse 10. Fear not, verse 13. Fear not, verse 14. And he says, I am with thee, in 10. And he says, I will help thee, in verse 13. And I will help thee, in verse 14. Notice in verse 14, he adds that reproof and that rebuke inside there too. What does he say? You worm, Jacob? And then he says, oh, and all you men of Israel too? He adds the reprove, the rebuke in there, but he's also got the exhortation. And if there's one thing that I know that God is, is that God is balanced. God is a balanced being. And we should take we should fall in line on that. We should follow suit in that example. Because a Christian that is out of balance is a sorry Christian. Now, the Lord here is encouraging. And we see that all through the Scripture. We went through it in, on Wednesday night last week in 2 Samuel chapter 10. He tells them, be of good courage, right? And he tells them to play like men. He tells them to be of good courage. You know what that is? That is the Lord telling somebody, and he was telling something to do something scripture, and he was telling them to be of good courage, and play, you know, we need to play like men, and we need to do this, and that was a biblical scriptural message, and you know what the Lord told him? He says, you need to be of good courage when you do that. He says, don't lose faith with that. Don't lack in courage when you do those things. You know what that is? That's the Lord telling you, I have your back when you go to do this. That's encouraging, is it not? That's exhortation. That's what that means. And if you want to apply it to our daily lives, I mean, it's all over the place. I'll use me and my wife for an example. She's back there going, oh, no, what now? 
right? But me and my wife have had conversations, even arguments about this, because when one of us goes to bat against the kids on something, we have an argument with the kids, you need someone to stand behind you when you tell them something. You have that backing. What does that do? That encourages and tells them to not be afraid of the blowback you're going to get from the kids because at least you got someone covering your back. That's good. That's the Lord. That's what he does. He tells us right here. He says, look, I've told you to do something. Now go do it. And when you go do it, I've preached a message one time says do it anyway. Right? Because there's times that we don't want to do that stuff. We don't want to get up and do something for the Lord. We don't want to hand out that gospel tract. We don't want to go witness to something. We don't want to get up and go to church on Sunday. We don't want to get up and go to, ch- get out, go to church on Wednesday or Sunday night. We don't want to do those things. But you know what? Sometimes we have to do it anyway. And the Lord is there to encourage you in those things. He says, I will help thee three times in this passage. he tells us not to be afraid. I got your back. Look, just knowing someone is going to be there to have your back is an encouragement when we have conflict. Now, all through the Scripture, we see God give people of encouragement. And the the first thing that popped into my mind when I was starting to write this is in Acts chapter 27. Now, Acts chapter 27, if you want to follow along, is the story of Paul on a ship. And Paul's on a ship, and uh, there's a, a named storm that comes up. Now, we here in Florida know what a named storm means, right? It means it's not just your regular, everyday kind of thunderstorm. This is a storm that has a name, and this is a storm that rages. It says here that they were with days without seeing the sun or the stars. We're going to get into that. But let me tell you something. The Lord was with Paul on that message. When you go through here, on day one of the storm, what did they do? They had to, fort, they had to fortify the whole of the ship. What were they doing? They were throwing ropes down, pulling them on the other side, and fastening them together so that the ship would hold together in the middle of the storm. On day two, they started throwing all of the cargo out. On day three, it says they took the tackle from the ship. That's parts of the ship they were taking apart and throwing it overseas because they couldn't figure out how to get light enough to get out of this storm. They were in the middle of a tempest. They were in the middle of something uh, that was raging. And what does Paul come up and do? He comes up, for it says, from an extended, you know, kind of a stay, leave from down in the hull of the ship, and he comes up, probably rubs the sleep off his eyes, and you know what he says? Oh, you know, be of good courage is what he says. Anybody who's ever been on a boat with four or five foot waves, you know what that's like, right? Anybody here get seasick? Just me doing this makes you want to throw up a little bit, right? Now, I've been out here at the inlet, right? And at the inlet, if there's a two-foot swells somewhere else, at the inlet, there's five foot, six foot, right? And I've been on that inlet doing one of these numbers trying to fish, and it's not easy. Now, imagine the entire ship in the middle of something, well, you can't even discern north from south, from east from west. You've got no clue where the sun's at. You've got no clue where the star's at. These are trained sailors and trained fishermen and, and who are afraid of what they're in the middle of. And Paul comes up and he says, be of good courage. Now, how did Paul have that kind of assurance? He says, because I was just down there praying. And an angel of the Lord came unto me and he says that, you know what? No matter what happens... I, the ship might break apart. I, I don't know, but I'm just telling you that nobody's going to die here. You know, what the, you know what the odd part about this whole thing is? Is that the people believed him. They went to go let their life rafts out in one passage, and you know what he says? He says, if you get off this ship, you're not going to live. You know what they did? They cut the ropes. I don't even want the temptation here. I don't even want the option to get off this boat. Why? Because some guy walked up and says, don't worry, God's got your back. In another spot, in another spot, it says that when they broke bread and they were eaten, you know what they says? They gave thanks unto the Lord. 
They were still in the middle of the storm. The tempest had raged at least three days. They said they were fasting for 13 days because of they didn't have all the food on the ship was almost gone. In the middle of all that, they broke bread, they gave thanks to the Lord, and they believed that he was going to get them out of that. Now, story goes is they, they run aground, and, uh, and they run aground safely. But the waves are so terrible that it beats a part of the back part of the ship, and they all end up going out. The Roman centurion that was on the ship wanted to kill all the prisoners so they couldn't escape. And God didn't let that happen either. So they got, what did they do? They made it safely onto dry land. They hadn't seen the sun for days. You can preach on that for a day. There's times when we don't see the sun in our lives. We don't see the bright spot. We don't see the light at the end of that tunnel. And guess what? Be of good courage. The Bible says, the heavens declare the glories of God, right? And the firmament showeth his handiwork. They didn't see that sun. They didn't see that stars. They didn't have anything visible in front of them to show them that God was there with them. You know what they had? They had a man standing in there exhorting them. The Lord's got us here. I know it doesn't seem like it. I know we're in the middle of something. I know it's hard. But trust me, the Lord has us. And he did. They did. Paul was encouraging them. You know what he could have done? He could have gotten angry and done that, I told you so, I told you so, I told you so. Because in the passage it does say, I did tell you not to, that we shouldn't lift out a creed. Right? There's the reproof and the rebuke. And what does he spend the majority of the time doing? Exhorting. See, we like to hang out at the reprove and the rebuke. And then when the exhort comes, it's, oh, I'm sorry, it's okay. Everything's going to be good. Pat on the back and then move on. Because we don't like to deal with some of those feelings and emotions. He says, I told you so. And then he moved on. And he started lifting them up instead of tearing them down. We as Christians need to be more encouraging to others. We spend so much time tearing people down and not enough time lifting people up. Another story that comes to mind is the story of Elijah. Not Elijah, Elijah. He has a story where he, has anybody ever heard the story of when Elijah and his servant were nearly captured by Syria, by the Syrians? It's not a, pot, not, a, not a lot of people know about it. It's, not a, it's, it's stuck in the middle of, of uh, one of the kings. Uh, and, and it doesn't get read a lot. <clears throat> but let me tell you something. What happened was Elijah was, in, was, was doing what he should have been doing and giving words to the king. And the king had escaped the hands of Syria several times. So finally, the king of Syria says, well, if this Elijah is stopping me from taking him over, how about I just take Elijah out? So he goes after him. He finds out where he's at. And overnight, the entire city is, is compassed about with chariots and men. So his servant wakes up, and he sees the entire city surrounded by, ser by, by servants of Syria, by, by men in chariots, by men in arms. And he goes and wakes up Elijah, and he says, Elijah, we're done for, man. We're toast. That's it. What does Elijah say? He gets on his knees. He gets on his knees, and he tells the Lord, he says, Lord, open the eyes of that young man right there so he can see what I know. The story goes that the next time the man looked out the window... God opened his eyes. And not only did he see the men in chariots of Syria, but he said the entire mountainside was full of chariots and horses that were a fire that the Lord already had in place, but he wasn't able to tell. Boy, you can preach that for a day. How many times have we, have we given up hope? How many times have we said, I can't get through it. There's no possible way for me to get out of that. And the Lord says, if you would just trust me for five seconds, I'll take care of it. 
I have things going that you can't see that you don't know. You know how many times the Lord has protected us that we don't know? How many times have you been hustling and hustling and hustling because you're late, i got to get in my car, i got to go, i got to go, and it seems that everything jumps in your way, and then you find out that if you were on that road at that time, there was a car accident, that might have been you. you. And that's just the easy stuff. That's the, that's the low-hanging fruit that we can see. There are times where the Lord has said, get away from my guy. And he holds back the spiritual things that we have no clue is even going on above our heads. He says, open thy, my servant's eyes. <laughs> Boy, open my servant's eyes. You know what he says in that verse? He says, fear not. Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now that servant's looking out the window and he goes, what are you talking about? There's nobody here. And Elijah says, just Take a breath. Anybody, any, anybody ever here ever been angry, been mad, and someone says, you need to calm down. That does not help. <laughs> calm down. I'm not calming down. I'm, I'm wired. I'm fired up. You know what he says? He says, fear not. He says, don't be afraid. That's not going to do it. He says, and then he gives him something. He says, those that are with us far outweigh those that are with them. Are we praying for each other that we, have, that we have open eyes, that they can have their eyes opened to encourage them to fear not? Our pastor in Indiana has told me one time, and he said it in the sermon, and it stuck with me. He said it, he says, uh, God plus you equals the majority. And I never thought about it that way. So whenever there are naysayers, whenever there are people who are, who are attacking you, and I don't mean from a ministry standpoint, I'm talking about from an everyday life standpoint, look, if, if you and God are on the same sides, who can withstand you? All that stuff is fleeting. All that stuff goes away. All that stuff will be here one minute and gone the next. Who is going to remain? The Lord. The Lord will remain. And now we talked about it last week. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, right? Now we know the doctrinal implication of that. That's not what I'm talking about. But the truth stands. If the Lord is with you, He's with you. He doesn't pick up and leave whenever we screw up. Thank God. Because if, if He left every time I screwed up, I'd be praying for Him to come back. That's all my prayer life would be. David did that when he prayed. He said, Lord, I screwed up. And he says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. I don't think he says holy. He says, take not thy spirit from me. <clears throat> See, we don't pray for each other to have our eyes opened. <clears throat> the Lord encouraged Elijah, Elijah, in 1 Kings chapter 19. We're not going to go into that story but because we, we know it. It's him underneath the juniper tree and he's asking for the Lord. Might as well just kill me now. The Lord did not. The Lord, Lord didn't answer that prayer. See, sometimes we offer foolish prayers. Instead of, Lord, open my eyes to, to see what I need to see, you know what he says? Just kill me. That's us praying in our flesh. That's Elijah being so discouraged and so depressed and so downtrodden and this is right after he had a great spiritual victory. Not, a spirit, not just spiritual, but a physical victory over somebody. And then, and then one thing happens, and what does he do? He has to run away for fear of his life, and he hides underneath the tree, and he gets so upset and so discouraged, he says, well, Lord, I just did something for you, and I was expecting something. I was expecting a big old blessing, and what happened? I got, I got some people confronting me, wanting to kill me, so now guess what? Now I'm out here in the wilderness, and I'm stuck, and I got no food, and I don't even have a fire. The only thing here is a tree. I just might as well curl up and die. Did the Lord answer that prayer? He did answer a prayer. But it's not the one he thought. Not the one he prayed. What did he do? He encouraged him. 
He sat him down and he says, you know what you need? You need some rest. Let me build you a fire and I'll get you some food. Once you get your belly full, I promise you'll feel a little better. And then, what does he say? He says, don't worry about it. Go back. <laughs> Go back? What do you mean? He went back. Took him a while. Took him a while to get there. And that was all the Lord's doing. But what did he need? He didn't need that, I just need to die. You know what he needed? He needed someone there to comfort him. And the Lord gave it to him. We need to encourage others, not just tear them down. I think about Moses. Moses, when you think about Moses, what do you think? You think of one of the greatest servants of God of all time. And certainly that is true. But Moses resisted his call. He says, uh, well, uh, are you sure you want me to go? I, me? He says, I'm nothing. Now think about it. He wasn't nothing. Moses was trained. He, he had Egyptian education. He probably had the Egyptian military education as well. And what did he do? He went to the back nine, and he stayed there for a while, and he served and served and served and served and served. And, served. and then when he finally got called, you know what he says? Lord, uh, I'm not too good at speaking. God say, uh, too bad, do it anyway? He says, no. He says, hold on a second. I said, I've already taken care of that for you. I have someone who's going to be your mouthpiece. Well, Lord, uh, I, I, who, who am I? I just don't have that power. And he goes, uh, hold on. That power is never going to come from you anyway. That's, I'm going to take care of that. You don't have to worry about that. All you have to do is go. But Moses was like, are you sure you want me? God's like, I got you taken care of. I've already got your mouthpiece. I've already got, I've already got everything all set up. All you have to do is take that step. What did he need? He needed a kick in the pants, so to speak. He needed that encouragement to go. He did, what he did not need was a God standing over him saying, you're going to do this or else. And that's what we as preachers and we as Christians do to others. We tear each other down. We don't lift each other up. God told Moses, don't worry about it. That power is going to come from me. How many times in the scripture does Paul tell Timothy not to be ashamed? He says, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. He goes on to tell Timothy to partake in the afflictions of the gospel. <laughs> because that happens. That happens. The gospel comes with things attached to it. You preach the gospel. What is, why did they say they were... They, Jesus Christ told them before it ever even happened, he says, they're going to hate you. And they're going to hate you because they hated me. What did he... He told one of his prophets, he says, uh, and this, this just, I don't understand this. The Lord tells him to go do something. He says, I want you to go preach to a nation. I want you to go preach to an entire people. They're your people. They're stiff-necked people. They're stubborn people. Guess what? They're not going to listen to a word you said. <laughs> and he's like, well, then why would I go preach? And he says, go and do it. Well, Lord, how am I supposed to do that? They're not going to listen to me. And he says, don't worry about that. You just do what you need to do. I'm going to take care of the rest. You are just my mouthpiece. Think about that for a second. Think about that for a second. He told a person to go preach something, and he says, not, you're not going to have one convert. <laughs> you're not going to have one convert. Not only are you not going to have a convert, they're not going to like you, and they're not going to listen to you. But God, had, God took care of that man. It didn't always seem like it. He was discouraged. He was downtrodden. He told him to do some things that he just didn't understand, but what did he do? He gave up. <laughs> and then as soon as he gave up, he saw some wickedness going on, and he said, i got to preach, Lord. And he preached. Let 
Paul continues to tell Timothy to not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. He goes on to tell him to partake in the afflictions of the gospel. And if you continue reading down there in 2 Timothy, he says, uh, For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hmm. He says, I know who I believe, who I believe. I know who I'm supposed to take care of. I know who I'm supposed to talk about. So how the question it begs the question, so how do I exhort somebody? Turn to Titus chapter one for me. Titus chapter one. Titus chapter one. Titus chapter 1, and we're going to pick it up in verse 9. He tells, Paul tells Titus to hold fast in faith and in the word. Titus chapter 1, verse 9, we'll pick it up in verse, um, verse 7. It says, For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, nor striker, nor <clears throat> not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Here it is. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. Now, if you take that phrase right by itself, it doesn't, it, it doesn't apply. But keep reading. Keep reading. That he may be able, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. You exhort by the Word of God. You exhort and encourage people through Scripture. Look, there are times where there are times where it's hard to worship, is it not? There are times where it's hard to come to church, is it not? That's just, that's just be honest. I want to encourage you to worship the Lord. I know that some of you don't get all of my preaching. I get I understand that. Because not every message is for you. You realize that some of those messages are for me? That's honest. I'm just being honest. Some of those messages that I... That it's not me writing them. Some of those messages, I don't, like to, I don't like to write them. I don't like to read them. I don't like to preach them. But you know, you know why? Because it's, it's me. And I understand that not every message hits home for everybody. And it encourages me as a pastor when I know something doesn't apply to you, when I know something doesn't hit home with you, and the very next week I see you sitting in my seats. It's not my, not my seats, it's the Lord's seats, you know what I mean. And it, that's, an, that's an encouragement to me. Look, if I'm here preaching on the bottle, and I know you don't have a problem with alcohol, and you're just sitting there, your mind's wandering, you're trying to figure out what you're going to do for lunch, and where you're going to go, and... Hopes that it gets done so we can beat the lunch rush and all that other stuff. I, I see that happen, and that happens, and that's okay, because that message isn't for you. doesn't mean you can't get something for it, but, but it encourages me to see when I know that people don't have that issue, and they sit through the sermon, and they come up to me and say, thank you for your service, or that was a great message. I know it didn't apply to you, and I know you're drifting off to sleep, but you know what? It's an encouragement to me that you're here the next week, because you know what? Maybe I can get something out of it next week. That's an encouragement to me. That's an ex exhortation to me. It was a blessing Wednesday night. It was a blessing Wednesday night. On Wednesday night, we only have a few people come. That's fine. I'll preach to those few who come. But Wednesday night, we had extra people come. We even had visitors. I mean, that was an encouragement to me to see people show up. And not just to me. That's not just an encouragement to me. That means something to the Lord, too. Because uh, I, I know people don't want to come to church on a Wednesday night. How many, church, how many churches... Have a Sunday night service nowadays. That we don't have a, that a lot of churches don't have Sunday nights anymore. Why? They can't get people to show up. It's it's almost non-existent to have a midweek service. Churches today 
don't have midweek services. Now, I'm not saying every church, that's not a blanket statement. That's, that is a blanket statement. I'm not saying every church has. There are churches that have them. But the few that do have them, they're meek. They're meager. You can't get people to come to church anyway. Say, I'm not saying that to put that on you. I'm just saying that's just the state of Christianity today. And I'm not trying to guilt people into coming on Wednesday or Sunday. You do as the Lord leads. But I'm telling you, it's an encouragement not just to me, but to the other people in this church when they see you in church on Wednesday and Sunday. It is. It's good to see. If, if, if you guys, if, let me tell you something. If a, if a guest walked in today and saw four people in church on a Sunday morning, would he be encouraged or discouraged about the church? <laughs> he would be discouraged. Right? If there's only four people in church on Sunday, he'd walk in and say, something's wrong with this church, time to go. But it's a red flag as soon as they ever walk in. It's an encouragement. Showing up to church, worshiping the Lord, is an encouragement to others. When you see someone else worship the Lord, it's an encouragement. It should be an encouragement to you. And I'm not saying this to talk about church attendance. That's, that, you miss the whole point if that's what you're thinking. It's not about church attendance. It's, about, it's an encouragement for other people to see you do something for Jesus. Yet the church is full of people who would rather tear you down than lift you up. And there I go again, the preacher focusing on the negative. I can't help it. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is sometimes. The point is, I want you to encourage you. I want to encourage you to exhort someone today. I want to encourage you to do something for somebody that lifts them up instead of tears them down. Break through the norm in our lives. And I know that's hard for us to do. It's hard for us. To, that's our comfort zone. That says something. We need to step out of that comfort zone of tearing people down and actually do something to lift people up. That does not mean you excuse their sin. Don't run to the, the other extreme. Something does someone, someone does wrong, you need to let them know they did wrong. That's simple. That's okay. I'm not telling you to ignore that stuff. I'm telling you, don't focus only on the tearing down. Because what happens when a preacher tears you down and tears you down and tears you down and tears you down and never lifts you up? You stay down. That's not what Christ intended. The best sermon is the one that tears you down but then tells you something at the end that you can really hold on to. He has to tear you down because there are strongholds, the Bible calls them, that we put on our heart to guard against things like that, to guard against the Word of God. You've got to tear something, you've got to chip away at some of those things sometimes so that when the good stuff comes in, it's got a free course. That's the way God works. I don't like being torn down, but sometimes you got to. The Bible, calls, the Bible likens us to him to a potter and us to clay. And we've all seen Brother Ingesath smash that piece of pottery in our, in our church. Sometimes he's got to break you in order to use you. But he always puts you back together. Because he doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. The point is, I want to encourage you to exhort someone today, to pray for them, to lift somebody up, and we can give them encouraging word, <clears throat> lead them to places of comfort in the Scripture, or we can just simply show it to them in our lives. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Show them something. Stop being the type of Christian that the world portrays us as and start being the Christian that the Lord has given us examples of. Exhort these people. Lift them up. Be good to them. Don't just be nasty to them. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this blessed book. I pray that you help us to, uh, <clears throat> to do these things that are sometimes against our nature, that are sometimes contrary to us, to lift somebody up, to give them some encouragement, to be that person that we don't... <laughs> be honest with you, often like to be. I pray that you do that with us every day, and I know you do. I know you lift us up. I know you encourage us. I know you exhort us. I know you, you give us those things, and Lord, I, 
just today, just this before before church, Lord, you, you you give me something when I was discouraged about something or worried about something, Lord, you sent something my way to show me. Don't worry about that. I've got to take care of. Help us to open our eyes to see those things. Because oftentimes you do it and we never see it and we never give you the honor and glory for it, Lord. Thank you for exhorting us. Thank you for giving us that comfort. Thank you so much for just being there when we think you're, even, even when we think you're not. Help us to see those chariots of fire up on the mountain from time to time so that we know. Help us, to send, help us by sending someone our way that, like Paul who says, be of good cheer. Or be not ashamed. Or fear not. Whatever, whatever the problem is, Lord, thank you so much for your exhortation and your comfort. Because without your comfort, we simply could not do it. Thank you so much for all those things. Thank you so much for you just being a good and gracious and merciful God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead, Dutch. Out, please. Amen. Stick around.